Yeah, good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You can be seated. It's good to see everybody here this morning. We are going to get right into the Word. And if you have your manuals, you can turn. <clears throat> Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to go first to section three, and then we may backtrack a little bit later on today. But <clears throat> starting in section three, that's on page 33 of your manual. <clears throat> now, this course, this training, is not how to have a better church healing service. It's about how to take the power of God out to the streets, to the grocery stores, to your jobs, where you live, because this is your everyday life. As long as we treat healing like an event, it will always be an event. It has to become a lifestyle. It has to become who you are. Now, I will tell you, <clears throat> some of the earlier DHTs that I taught were more technically specific. Uh, you know, it's kind of like if I ask you, okay, describe to me in detail how you tie your shoe. Most of you couldn't tell me without actually tying it and telling me as you did it because you don't even think about it. Now, when you first started, you had to think about every detail and over and loop under and pull tight and all that kind of stuff <clears throat> in the beginning. Then later on, it got to be such a part of you that you could do it while you were talking and do anything else, and you can't even describe it anymore because it's a part of you. That's the way healing is to me now. It's not something I do. It's just part of me. It's, it's in my DNA. And because of that, when I teach it, I have to actually stop and think about the details because now it just happens because I've trained myself to believe what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. So a lot, that's called mind renewal in that area. So that's what we're shooting for here. And they say that it takes approximately three days to get you to turn around, getting your mind to turn around. And then after that, on the fourth day, then you actually start, if you keep practicing it, it starts to become part of you. So the real key is, listen closely, take notes, start doing it, but keep doing it after this seminar. Amen? Amen. Now, we'll tell you more about that. Now, section three, um, <clears throat> you'll, you'll hear me say this over and over again. Of everything I teach, this is probably the most important. <laughs> okay? I will say that almost every session. <laughs> I'll just tell you now. Uh, if it wasn't important, I wouldn't be telling you, right? But this, if you don't get this, at some point you're going to get weird. You're going to, go, you're going to do weird things, and you're going to go right back into some of the sacred cows, some of the traditions of men, and you're not going to be effective. One of the things that we've noticed, um, not getting too far into a history of this, but when I first started, I was, from the very beginning, I was getting about 15 to 20% success rate, maybe up to 25%. That's before, that was based on the teaching I had at the time. <clears throat> One out of four people that you pray for getting healed isn't good enough. But that was where I was at. And I didn't know it, but the, the, the church world at that time was probably getting maybe 8 to 10%, maybe. Right? And so we had a good start. But if three out of four don't get healed, like I said, that doesn't work. And so we kept digging. Now, the reason I kept digging is because I buried my daughter. That's what got me started. That's what got me going after it. Uh, when, and we were believing God. We were learning how to believe God. We were learning some of these things. What I was taught was good. It just wasn't good enough. It had good pieces, but there were big pieces missing. <clears throat> so uh, she passed away on February 13th, which was a Friday, Friday the 13th. And we buried her the next day, which was the 14th, which was Valentine's Day. And <clears throat> whenever she died, the first thing I did was I started getting on the phone and trying to call a lot of people, a lot of ministers that had taught healing, people that I had there at that time, cassette tapes and things like that. And I couldn't reach them. Couldn't get a hold of anybody. And at the time, that really upset me. Uh, now I understand it a little better. But at the same time, there's no excuse for it. And so <clears throat> I... At that point, we couldn't get a hold of anybody. We couldn't get anything done. And so the next day when we buried her, we stood at that grave, that little grave site, uh, at a cemetery just outside of McKinney, Texas. 
And as we watched that little white casket do, go down to the ground, I remember it was, it was cold. It was a bad day all around. And everybody else, they had kind of, they give you a chance for everybody to walk away. And they wanted my wife and I to walk away too because sometimes people kind of go to pieces whenever they actually put the casket in the ground. But we stood there, and I remember holding my wife's hand, and I remember telling God, God, there was no man for me when I needed one. But if you will teach me the truth about healing and your power, I will be that man for somebody else so that they don't have to have a grave like I do. And so for the last 40 years now, we have spent our life searching out the truth about healing and the power of God. Now, I wasn't trying to expose anything. I wasn't trying to go against anybody. I, I really didn't care what I found. I just wanted truth. And <clears throat> we began seeking. And if you seek, you find. It's, it's just that simple. God is faithful to his word. And so we started seeking, and I started hearing about this man named John Lake. And as I said yesterday, I heard the great success he had and then also the great success that the people he trained had, which really that's what stuck in my mind. Wigglesworth was an amazing man, but he never really reproduced himself, not in mass. He reproduced himself somewhat in Dr. Summerall, but not in a lot of people. Well, John Lake reproduced himself in at least 16 men and women who were able to do what he did. I always thought it kind of strange because he had 16 brothers and sisters, and eight of them had died before he was 21. And it was funny that whenever he trained divine healing technicians, he trained 16. And they were getting over 100,000 healings a year. That's 20,000. Actually, what it comes down to, if you think about this, each one of these men and women, 16 men and women, he had 100,000 healings in a five-year period. Let me get that accurate. He had 100,000 healings in a five-year period. And so that's about 20,000 healings per year. And he had 16 men and women helping him. So that's about, if we average it out, that's about 1,000 healings each, a little over. And so that means that they were all, and a matter of fact, some of the greatest testimonies you'll hear weren't even by Dr. Lake. They've been attributed to him now, but they were actually worked through by people that worked with him. And so whenever I started studying that, I said, okay, this man not only knew how to do it, he knew how to teach it so that other people could get it. And uh, so we began studying uh, everything I could find on Dr. Lake. And eventually uh, got in touch with his family. Uh, found them living out in Kennewick, Washington at the time. Uh, <clears throat> spent a couple of years talking with them. Actually, about three years, two, about a little, about, a little about, about three years, talking with his daughter Gertrude, and she passed away in 83. And then her husband, Wilford, uh, passed away in 87, June of 87. And uh, from 83 to 87, I was working very closely with Wilford. And so uh, before Wilford passed away, he sent me a lot of material and said that I was, they believed that I was the person who was supposed to pick up the ministry because of a prophecy that Dr. Lake gave before he died. So they passed the ministry to me. I grabbed it, got all the information I could. I wasn't interested in the ministry. I was interested in truth and results. And so when they started sending me stuff, they gave me names of about 100 people that had been around Dr. Lake. Uh, so I and had been at his church, and so I called them, found them, many as I could, started asking them questions. I had a list of questions. I figured if I asked everybody the same questions, if I heard the same answers to some of the questions, that would be the truth. If I heard different answers, then would that be more opinion or how people saw it? And so I took all the answers and kind of put those together. Then, just before Wilford died, he sent me uh, the list of names of people uh, that just, like I said, had worked with Dr. Lake, but also that uh, he knew that we're still alive. And so I started trying to find them. But just because they're alive doesn't mean they stay in the same place. Some people move. And so I had a little bit of time trying to track them down. But then in 1995, I went down to Houston, Texas, and uh, out, just outside of Houston, a city called Alvin. And I <clears throat> went to hear a woman preach there named Pauline Parham, which was Charles Parham's daughter-in-law, and he was the more or less the founder of the Pentecostal movement. And so I went to hear her, and while I was there, I remembered I had a list of names of people that were in Houston, because Dr. Lake was there in 1927 and started a church there. And so I looked these people up, 
Only one of them was still alive. Her name was Miss Jeters. And she had married the son of one of Dr. Lake's divine healing technicians. And so I went to talk to her. She was 92, 93 at the time, somewhere right through there. And I went over to the nursing home where she was at, started asking her questions, and <clears throat> spent a couple of days actually going back and forth talking to her. And finally, she just kind of got fed up and just said, you know, all your questions would be answered if you just had a manual. And I said, well, yeah, that'd be awesome, you know, if I could find one. She goes, well, I have one. You know, and I felt, I felt like Fred Sanford. You know, like, <laughs> what, what do you mean? What do you mean you have one? <clears throat> now, those of you that are under 40, you have to look that up on the Internet of who Fred Sanford is. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but she said, well, I got one. And I said, well, can I see it? She said, you can see it, but you can't have it till I die. And so I said, okay. So they brought it over, and I was making notes as much as I could. And all this, but I had to leave. And so I went back home, and my wife has told me to quit saying it this way, but I jokingly say it took me two years to pray her to death um, because I went back and told the Lord, Lord, I really need that manual. <laughs> Lord, Lord, she, she's really old, and she deserves her reward. So, Lord, so about two years later when she passed away, um, the family sent me the manual. So now when I, got, when I started reading the manual, making the notes, my success rate went up. Instantly, just by changing just a couple of things. Then when I got the manual, I sat down and started studying it, started doing it, I'd read it, go do it. Come back, read it, go do it. And as I did, my success rate kept growing. So for nine months in our home, now this is, I wasn't in full-time ministry. I was still working what people would call a secular job. But I was, uh, so I wasn't in, in ministry. People weren't asking me to preach. Every now and then, somebody might ask me to preach. But it, it definitely wasn't on a consistent basis. And, but during that time, I started praying for people. We, we would go to church. We were attending a church. And we'd pray for people, and they'd get healed. So then people started calling us at home. I got a friend. Can I bring him out to your house? I said, yeah, bring him on out. And so for nine months, literally every person that came to our home got healed. 100% complete success rate. Didn't matter what they have. Didn't matter how long they had had it. Didn't matter how they got it. Didn't matter if there was sin in their life. Didn't matter. It didn't. None of that mattered, right? I went through everything. My, my. We had one lady that we had known years ago. Uh, when we had visited, kind of regularly, uh, to a actually it was called a Oneness Pentecostal church, and uh, this lady was kind of the pillar of the church. Amazing woman, uh, amazing woman of God, and they called me and said, "Do you know this person?" I said, "Well, the name's familiar." And they said, "Well." She used to be a person at this church. And I said, okay, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Well, she fell away from the Lord, and she is completely demon-possessed. And we want to bring her to your house. And so we had known her, and I said, well, yeah, of course. And they said, well, she can't get here because they actually had her confined uh, at a place. And they said, we can't get her out for another two days, I think, well, two or three days. And she said, and they said, uh, so can we bring her? I said, yeah. So we made the date. And I told my wife, I said, this person's coming, and... You know, we and she'll be here in two days. And my wife said, "Well, are you gonna are you gonna fast and you know pray, you know, before this uh, to get ready for this?" I said, and "I said, you know, because we had had things going on, but this was the first time it had been planned in advance." And I said, "No, I'm not, because I'd already killed all the other sacred cows. I mean, pretty much all of them, right? I'd gone through, proved they were not true, and I said this is the first time, because I like the scientific approach." of looking at things and, you know, just black and white. It's just the way it is. You know, if it's scientific, what they call it, empirical proof, then that's how I wanted to do it. And I said, this is my chance to test my theory that fasting and prayer, in this sense, does not increase power to cast out devils. And she said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go eat some good meals. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go eat. And so for three, now, I'm not saying I didn't pray, but I didn't pray about her. I prayed like I normally would in my normal life. I just did everything normal, but I didn't fast, and I didn't go to prayer on this specifically So, because I wanted to make sure when she came there, everything was normal. I wanted to know, do I have to prepare, or can you just, if something just pops up, can you deal with it? And so I've been trained about faith. I understood that faith, with all, with faith, all things are possible, so I thought this should be one of those all things. <clears throat> so... I didn't fast, didn't pray especially or anything else. They brought her out. When she got there, 
She was quite different from what we remembered her, to be honest with you. Looked quite different. Her mannerisms were different. Before when we knew her, she was just had an amazing, just a spirit of peace was upon her. And just, it was, she was amazing at that time. When she came to my house, she, you know, you ever hear the term like a cat on a hot tin roof? That's the way she was. She was constantly moving. And it, and it wasn't just walking. She was kind of, kind of jerk moving back and forth, constantly fidgeting, moving around. Her head was down, would never look at me. Going back around, we had a living room area, and so we brought her into the living room. She was going back and forth, and so finally I kind of cornered her. And the way I cornered her was uh, we had a couch, and then I had the chair that I would usually sit in if I was talking to the people. And as she would move in that direction, I grabbed the chair and moved it closer until I finally kind of hemmed her in to where there was nowhere to go, and she was just kind of standing there. And then finally I yelled at her, and I clapped my hands real loud and had her look up. When she did, we locked eyes, and that's whenever I grabbed that thing and told her to come out. And in about 30 seconds, she was free. And so and that, that was kind of the last sacred cow that I had to check off my list. And so we've proven that. That's why I said yesterday, the only hindrance to healing is that you believe there are hindrances to healing. If you believe that nothing can stand before you, nothing can stand before you. Why? Because faith works. Because God will work through you, but it requires faith for him to work through you. Amen? That's, that's where you work with him. Now, so as we got started, um, <clears throat> then we started, and, and like I said, for over nine months, every person that came to our home got healed. Now, they didn't all get healed instantly. Some of them took maybe as much as two to a little over two, almost three weeks, but that was it. And I, I don't care what it was. I don't care what type of disease or, or anything else. Then, and we were going to the hospital. People were, there was a man at a church locally, not a church I went to, but uh, he actually went through another, uh, through a Bible school that preached healing, and he heard some of our success, so he came over and said, would you go with me to the hospital? We went out there, prayed uh, for a man that uh, the pastor didn't know I was going with him. I had, by this time, I had developed a little bit of a reputation, uh, and not everybody was thrilled <laughs> with what I was doing, because I was pretty blunt on some things. And especially as I killed the sacred cows, they didn't always like that. But they had lumped me in with another group that, honestly, I would have considered myself part of that group too. But that group did something that I didn't do because of what I had read about Dr. Lake. And what that was is that many times if a family member was sick, they would put the blame on the family member either for not having faith to get healed or for... In in this case, it was a man that was in a coma, had been in a coma for some time, and the, that church that preached this particular type of doctrine about healing kind of blamed the woman for not having faith for her husband, right? Which I didn't do that. I'd never put the blame on anybody else. I don't even put the blame on the sick person for not being able to get themselves well, right? Because I had learned better than that. I'm just... I'm, Cutting through. We'll talk about that later. But So I went out to the hospital. <clears throat> the woman was there. The man was there. He was still in a coma. The man that asked me to go with him, I went with him. And while I was there, we started, well, I say praying. We really don't pray. Uh, if I pray, I pray before I get there. But it's not about that healing. It, it's just simply um, thanking God for the opportunity to participate in God's victory over this enemy. That's all it is. I don't ever ask God about a person's healing. He's already said his opinion about every person's healing, and that is by his stripes they were healed, right? So I don't, I don't talk to God about healing. I don't pray for God to heal. He said, you heal the sick. Now, I understand it's a power of God in and of myself. I can do nothing, so, but I'm not by myself, right? And so we cooperate with God. Now, we're standing there. And I didn't know it, but as we began commanding, because there's no brainwave activity on this man. And while we're commanding, all of a sudden, <laughs> the man wakes up. Well, I, I'll give you the, not the whole story, but the first part of it. We're standing there. We're commanding. Nothing's happening at this point. The wife is standing there. Me and this other man are standing there. We're commanding quietly, but firmly. And I didn't know it, but the pastor of that church had walked up behind us. And he didn't like the fact that this man had brought me with him because this man went to his church. And so he didn't like that fact that, that I was there. 
because he assumed that it wasn't going to work, and he assumed that we were going to blame the woman for her husband not getting healed, blame somebody for not having enough faith. That was their idea. And so uh, he called the other, the pastor called the other guy out. I stood there. I really didn't know that pastor. I'd heard of him, but I didn't know anything about him. He called him out, went out in the hallway. I could hear them. They were getting rather loud, uh, him about him bringing me there because I was, you know, one of these people, okay? And while they're arguing, the monitor starts blipping, right? <laughs> and the man starts moving around. He opens his eyes. He looks around. The wife grabbed him, hugged him. Machines started going off. Nurses started coming in. Everybody's moving around. And the pastor is standing there arguing, why would you bring him hit? And he's watching all the stuff going on. And he kind of just had to shut up and walk away, right? And then later on, he, I actually talked with him, and he said, you know, well, this is, what I, this is who I thought you were. And I said, well, that's not who I am, and maybe you should find out before you start blasting somebody, right? I wasn't very nice, right? I wasn't very easy on him. I didn't make it easy on him. <laughs> I kind of pointed out how quick he was to judge. Um, you know, and, and I'll be honest with you, back then I was a lot more brash and kind of had something to prove. But I'll be honest with you, I didn't care what people thought. All I wanted was truth, and I wanted to see the power of God. That was it. And I didn't care if it was in church, out of church. I just wanted truth. I knew the truth was in the Bible. But honestly, if I had found the truth, you know, in a Jehovah Witness Kingdom Hall, I'd have went that way. Now, I have, when I met my wife, she was a Jehovah's Witness. My mother-in-law was a pioneer, if you know what that means. They actually get paid to go around and go door to door. That's what she did. So when, when I met him, uh, we had some serious discussions. And so I was uh, bombarded with a lot of their doctrine and had to go to the Bible and, and proved that it wasn't true. And so now it's not just, well, I don't believe in it. I've proven it not true. You know? And I actually told my mother-in-law while she was a Jehovah's Witness, I said, you know, the reason I believe what I believe is because of you. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, you hit me with your Jehovah's Witness doctrine. And at that time, I was just a Bapticostal, you know. I, you know, the, a Baptist of spoken tongues. That was as far as it had gone at that point. And I said, so, but, I, but you hit me with your doctrine, so I had to go to the Bible and found out neither one of us was right. And I found the truth. And so I, um, you know, she didn't like that a whole lot. But, but over the years, she watched our life, and she saw the things that happened. And then, well, up until a couple of years ago, she worked for me and helped transcribe my books. And so she kind of came across to the right side. It took a little while, though. Uh, once she was in a car wreck, had a very serious neck problem, and I didn't really know about it because they hide that stuff from me a lot of times because they think I'll jump on it. You know, so. And so they hide it from me. So we went to eat with her, and we were sitting in the parking lot, and I saw her sitting in the car with this neck brace on, and I thought, hmm, okay, didn't know about that. My wife went over and started talking to her. I see him looking at me, and I'm, I'm like, what, what, what's going on? And so my wife came back and said, my mom want you to come pray for her. Now, this was big. She was still Jehovah's Witness, right? Now, this is huge, right? And so I said, really? And she said, yeah, yeah, come, come pray for her. I'm like, maybe I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> and she, my wife looks at me and she goes, Curry. And I'm like, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. So I go over and I ask her, and her name is Marie. And I said, Marie, I said, so you, you want me to pray for you? And because she knew me when I was pretty crazy and probably a little more than just a little demon-possessed Okay, before God got a hold of me anyway. But it was funny because she said, well, she said, yeah, you can pray for me, but first look me in the eye and tell me you're not the same man you used to be. And I said, Marie, I said, I think you know pretty much or, or you wouldn't even be considering this. And she said, yeah, you're right. Go ahead and pray. <laughs> so, so I laid hands on her, commanded her neck to be healed. I said, all right, and I take that brace off and start moving around. She did it, and she was completely healed, had no more pain in her neck. After that, that's whenever she started working for me. <laughs> Amen. So, and she just retired just a couple of, just about two years ago, I guess. So most of the books out there on the book table were either put together uh, by my mother-in-law or my daughter. Yeah, my daughter-in-law. And so um, now there's a couple that I actually sat down and wrote. But um, that, that just shows that your family can be brought in if you just consistently keep moving forward. Amen. So <clears throat> during that time, uh, we st I started learning these things and started practicing them. And then when I came back, and, and like I said, for over nine months, 
every person came in, which again proved that it didn't matter what they had, how they got it, all these things that everybody said. So I started realizing that, and this was the big thing, this actually came about by another way, that uh, I was at a Russian church and had prayed for everybody one night, over a thousand people, and, and my interpreter was not there, so all I could do was really just take them by the hand and command life. Because I remember standing there, my interpreter was gone, I thought, okay, they don't speak English, I don't speak Russian, what am I going to do? And I thought, you know what? No matter what they told me, I'm still going to do the same thing. I don't do different things for different people. We do the exact same thing for every person. I said, you know, if the answer is always the same, the question doesn't matter. And so I jumped down off the platform and went through and grabbed people's hands in the name of Jesus. Be healed head to toe right now. Life in Jesus' name. Just commanded, went through. Didn't know one thing I prayed for. Didn't know one thing that anybody there had. I mean, nothing. Went through, took about... A little over two, almost three hours, I guess, to pray for everybody. Went back to the hotel room that night, came back the next morning. That was Saturday night. Sunday morning, came back to preach the Sunday morning service. And the pastor, amazing man of God, he, I guarantee before he was saved, he was KGB. I mean, he just, he had that look. He had that demean, demeanor about him. And I noticed if he spoke, people, I didn't understand what he said, but if he said something, somebody would disappear and then they would come and they had it done. I mean, he was instantly obeyed. Right? So I figured they were afraid they were going to get banished to Siberia or something if they didn't do it. So he stands on the platform. He said, if you were prayed for last night and healed, come forward. And so it looked like the whole church started moving forward. So he stopped him. He said, no, no, no. Not if you were just prayed for. If you were actually healed and you can tell it, come forward. And everybody's like, yeah. And they just come on down. And so we spent, I didn't get to preach at all. We spent the entire service just testimonies. Tumors disappeared, cataracts disappeared. I mean, you name it, all kinds of things. And I didn't know one thing that I prayed for. Now, and so that proved to me that you don't have to be specific. And then, and all of these little, it was these little things that started fitting together. And I started going in and searching them out in the Bible. And then I found that's exactly how Jesus did it. And how Jesus, he, many times, he, you know, somebody asked him specifically, he would minister specifically. But if they didn't, he would just lay hands and they would get healed. And it's amazing because there are no limits to it if you don't put limits. Just like we read yesterday in Ephesians 3.20, that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can even ask or think. Well, if he can do that, then I don't, I don't have to know. Because number one, I'm not the healer. He lives in me. We can release him. But if he's the healer, I don't have to know the problems. Amen? All I have to, be able to, all I have to know how to do is let what I have out. That's all I have to know, really. Why? Because that's what Peter did in, in Acts chapter 3. He said, silver and gold have I none, such as I have, I give unto you. Isn't that right? So he knew what he had, and he knew he could give it away. That's the key, right? So that's what we're going to learn here this week. Now, <coughs> however, if you don't get this, <coughs> excuse me, uh, if you don't get this first section, then You'll always be wavering and wondering. So you have to get this locked down, right? And I'll give you a couple of examples as we do. But uh, page 33, hopefully you're there. If you haven't found it by now, give it up. You're not going to, right? So I've given you plenty of time to find page 33, okay? <laughs> now, <clears throat> notice here, this is what we call final authority. <clears throat> this is the basis of our discussion. The Word of God has to be final authority. Now, I could spend the rest of the day doing nothing but drilling this in because this is what makes it all work. If you will, if the enemy can get you to back off of this, he will beat you. So you have to get this drilled in to where no matter what, you will not back off what the Word of God says once you decide what it says in context, rightly divided, you cannot back off. Amen? Now, I'll give you an example of what that means because if you're really going to stand on the Word, there will be times <clears throat> when it looks like you're stupid and people are going to say things. And that's when you have the opportunity to move off the Word. And this is where our theology generally comes from is when people move away from the Word and give an excuse of why it didn't work. And that excuse becomes a tradition of men or as we would call it a sacred cow. 
And so why? Because we have to come up with a reason. I'll, I'll give you an example, like I said, in just a minute. Now, let's, let's look at this. I want to give you the word because I want you to be able to say, devil, it's written. <clears throat> and you can't say it's written if you don't know it's written. Amen? So, <clears throat> first off, the word is our final authority. Our experiences must be judged by Scripture, not Scripture judged by our experiences. And the word of God is forever settled in heaven, but we must settle it on earth. You are the deciding vote. God knows what the truth is. The devil knows what the lie is. You get to decide on which side you're going to stand. Okay? Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Now, <clears throat> notice here, he says, thy faithfulness is unto all generations. So if the word is forever settled in heaven, now notice he says, in heaven your word is settled, but your faithfulness is unto all generations. That's earth. So his word is settled in heaven. It's not going to change. He's not going to change his word for you. He's not going to change his word to match where you are. If there's going to be any change, you're going to have to change to, to agree with him. Amen? He says, you have established the earth and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances for all are thy servants. Unless your law, your word, had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine affliction. The word of God has to be your delight or you will perish in your affliction. Amen? <clears throat> Notice, God's word is forever settled. It will never change. Uh, this is actually one of the greatest, I consider one of the greatest revelations I ever had. I remember opening the Bible one day. I'd been studying the Bible. Well, <clears throat> my mom taught me how to read the Bible using the King James when I was two years old, something like that, maybe right around there. And <clears throat> growing up, I'd been hit by a car. My dad had backed over me, uh, didn't see me. I was in the driveway trying to get in the car. He was going somewhere. We were at a family reunion. He thought I was inside. He backed over me. And <clears throat> when he did it, they thought it killed me. He jumped out of the car. He heard it, heard something happen. He jumped out, looked at me, saw me under the car, not moving. Uh, the car had the way the wheel well was it had grabbed this side of my head and pulled my hair and my ear. This ear was ripped completely off my body. My scalp was ripped from here across to this ear, and all the scalp was moved, pulled down on the front so that the scalp was actually loose off and was pulled down like a mask, actually. And so <clears throat> my dad ran in the house yelling, I killed our baby. Everybody ran out. My grandfather ran out also, uh, saw me, picked, up, picked me up, picked up my ear, which was lying beside me, uh, put me in his pickup truck and drove me about three blocks to a local hospital where they took me into the emergency room, began working on me. Uh, the doctor looked at me and said, there's no way he can live. Uh, just get ready to bury him. My mom, my, my dad's family were Nazarene and Methodist, and my mom was basically the only Pentecostal there, not that you know, God only hears Pentecostal prayers. I'm not saying that, okay? But I'm saying she began, she was the only one that believed that God could heal at that point. And so uh, immediately she dedicated me to God, said, God, he's yours. Let him live. I'll raise him for you. And so <clears throat> the doctors were doing surgery on me. And after about an hour and a half, they, he, the one doctor came out and said, um, it looks like he might actually live. Uh, but if he does, he'll be a vegetable all of his life. And you'll have to dress him, feed him, take care of him, all this stuff. And so he went back in to do some more work. And <clears throat> my mom went back to praying. I said, God, that's, that's not good enough. If you're going to let him live, then let him be normal. And I'm always joking. Uh, there's a lot of controversy over whether I'm normal. Okay? <clears throat> but I always tell him, if I'm not normal, leave me alone because it's working for me. All right? So now <clears throat> my, wife, <laughs> my wife said, you know, when that doctor put you back together, he left out the common sense. And I said, well, you know what? I figured if, if he left it out, I figured God figured it wasn't that important, right? And so he put in me what I, what I needed. So we just left it at that. So <clears throat> now when a few, about an hour and a half later, the doctor came out again and said, we can't find any signs of brain damage so far. He hadn't passed out or anything, uh, but we're not sure, but we, we believe he's going to be okay. But even if he is, he will never have any hair and he will never have any hearing because we had to sew his ear back on. And so he went back to do more work. My mom went back to praying and said, God, that's not good enough. If you're going to let him live and let him be normal, then let him have hair and let him have hearing. I have perfect hearing. Before I had a hair, just got a haircut before I got here. It was longer, but 
<clears throat> regardless, everything they said, God proved wrong. Amen? And so at that time, I'm, I was uh, 17 months old. So my mom uh, <clears throat> began teaching me. She, uh, I stayed at home at that point. They didn't send me to school. I was an only child. My mother was, I think, actually 17 at that time. And my dad was 18. <clears throat> he was in the U.S. Air Force. And so she kept me at home and began teaching me how to read using the King James Bible. And so for years, she would read me to sleep. And then as I learned to read, I would read her to sleep with the Bible. Uh, and then not too many years ago, I told her, I said, you know, it's a strange thing. I'm still reading people to sleep with the Bible, you know, <laughs> even today. So it's still working. So, you know, but um, so uh, <clears throat> in, in all that, uh, but, but uh, I, that word was put into me and I didn't even know it. And for years after that, and the funny thing was, I knew the scriptures, but I didn't know where they were because she didn't say chapter 1, verse 3, and not, we just read through the Bible. So the word was in there. So I would hear scriptures. They would come to my remembrance, but to find out where they were, I had to look them up. I had to get a concordance, and so I had to start looking. So I knew, I didn't always know the address, but I knew it was in there, and then I had to find it. So now <clears throat> in that, notice here, as I said before, I've been reading the Bible you know, from the beginning. But the amazing thing was, one day it hit me when I opened the Bible and read it, and I remember, you know, of course, I've read this before. And then I realized, you know what? This, this word hadn't changed in over 20 years. What it says today, it's going to say 100 years from now. This is not going to change. So if anything's going to change, it's going to have to be me, not this word. And to me, that was the greatest revelation to this day that I still ever re received. Because when you get a hold of the fact that the word is not going to change and that you have to learn to function with it, Everything changes in your life. So, now notice here, uh, what it says today, it's going to say 100 years from now. You're not going to get God to change his mind to agree with you. You're going to have to change your mind to agree with him. His word is settled, and the word settled in Psalm 119, verse 89, is the Hebrew word nasab, and it means literally to station or to put into place, and it means <clears throat> to set up, uh, let me give you, yeah, to, there it is, to set as a boundary. The Word of God is set as a boundary. It is established. It's settled. It's never going to change. And the amazing thing is how it's used. It says it is set as a boundary, which means we are not to go beyond it. Now, that may sound limiting, but only if you don't know the Bible. Because I don't know of anybody yet that has ever needed to go outside the boundaries of this. I don't know anybody that's actually lived all of this yet. So there is plenty in there to do. And people say, well, that you're being narrow-minded. Well, I can afford to be. I'm right. So there you go. All right? I mean, so I'm, I'm not worried about it. But there's enough in the Bible uh, that, I'm, that I'm still not doing. You know, it's amazing to be, be how people will say, you know, <clears throat> the same works and greater. Let's do the greater works. Well, how about you get busy doing the same works first, and then we'll, we'll concern ourselves with the greater works. Until you can do the same works, there's no need to think about the greater works. Amen? Walking on water. There we go. <laughs> I got a story for you. Okay. Oh, I know that. <laughs> Do you? Okay. <laughs> you know, some things you wish you were mentally present at the moment so that you could so you could appreciate it. But sometimes something happens and you look back and go, wow, that's what that was. And you're like, you want to go back to it, but you can't. It's already done. But anyway, we'll talk about that. Anyway, <laughs> so now notice there on page 34. This means that God has set his word as a boundary beyond which no Christian should go. <clears throat> now, there's a lot here, and there's some things even now. You know, I'm still learning, still growing, um, and, and God, man, he never ceases to amaze me uh, how faithful he is to his word and the, just the nuggets that are hidden in his word. Um, <clears throat> so here in Isaiah 55:11. It says, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it will prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now, <clears throat> you'll notice that God said in Genesis, it said, the, the way King James says it, God said, let there be light. The Hebrew says, light be, because God always speaks in commands. He didn't say, let it. So when he was also saying, uh, let your light shine, he wasn't saying, let your light shine. He's saying, Shine your light. It's more of a command, right? But here he said, light be and light was. And you realize God only said that one time. And do you realize it's still working? 
So God doesn't have to repeat himself over and over again to get something to work. He can say it one time. Now, the amazing thing is God did say three different times at least, and actually there's more than that, but I'll mention three, about your healing. He said in Isaiah 53, by his stripes we are healed, right? Then he said in Matthew 8, 16 and 17, he said he healed all the sick that were there so that it might be fulfilled that which the prophet Isaiah said that he carried our sicknesses and bore our infirmities. Then it says in 1 Peter 2, 24, by whose stripes you were healed. So something happened <clears throat> between Matthew 8 and 1 Peter 2 that changed Isaiah 53 from a present tense wordage right, to past tense. And that was called the crucifixion or the passion, which included the whipping posts. So at one point it was present tense, but now it's past tense. doesn't mean it passed away. It means it is settled to the point where now you can't get around the fact that it is a fact, all right? And we'll even prove that <clears throat> to you as we go on. Now, there's a lot of uh, scriptures here that I'm not going to be able to get to all of them in this session. But in Psalm 138, verse 2, it says, I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and for your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. So his word is above his name. Now, people look at that and go, wow, he put his word above his name. Do you realize every person's word is above their name? If your word is no good, your name is no good. Isn't that right? So every person's word is above their name. In other words, whatever their word is, their name is. Now, <clears throat> the amazing thing is God has several names that he gave us, and one of those names is Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that healeth thee, not the God who used to heal or not the God who's going to heal, but the God that heals. That's always present tense. And until God passes away, healing can't pass away. Amen? Nobody has a right to change God's name. All right? So we have to realize that God is always a healer. He's always been a healer. He was a healer in the old covenant. He was a healer in the new covenant. He's a healer in the new covenant that we're in now. Amen? And it'll always be the same. Now, notice <clears throat> there's several more. Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. That's just the last part. But the first part is, I'm the Lord, I change not. If he was ever the healer, he's always a healer. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday and today and forever. Amen? Not just until the end of a dispensation, but the same forever. And listen carefully. I know, and we'll get more into this as we go along. Uh, a lot of these things, I'm going to mention these, and then we will bolster them as we go along. If <clears throat> Paul mentioned several times, he said, if anybody comes preaching another gospel or another Jesus, so you can preach another Jesus. You can preach another gospel. I mean, it's not legal according to God, but I'm saying, can you? is it possible to preach something not true? Yes. The thing is, if you preach a Jesus who doesn't heal any longer, you're preaching a mutant Jesus. It is another Jesus because he is the same Jesus, and if he ever healed, he always heals. Right. Amen? Amen? Now, the, you have to realize, Jesus, now I'll just say this, then we'll take a break. The Bible says that Jesus is the Word made flesh. Is that right? He's God in the flesh, but he was the Word made flesh. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so, if you take this book called the Bible and you look at all the chapters, all the verses, all the books in it and you take each one because each one of those, even in the Old Testament they were all geared to point us to Jesus and to reveal Jesus to us. <clears throat> if you look at all these verses, now if you look at human DNA, the human DNA or the genome as we know it has all these different pieces to it. If you take this Bible, <clears throat> and I'll just give you a, a, an abstract way of looking at it. If you take this Bible, the Holy Bible, now I'm not saying King James or any other version. I'm talking about the original manuscripts, the way what, what was actually said in the actual languages. So let's use that, all right? <clears throat> now, if you were to take it, cut out the pages, cut each verse out separately, and put, take them all separate, each one of those would be a genome of Jesus' DNA. Do you understand that? So now, now, again, abstract, right? If you took all those verses you cut out and you put them into some type of mixture and then you put that mixture in a microwave and you push, you know, on, 
then when that thing dinged, Jesus would step out. I, I said it was abstract, okay? <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying? If you take this book and take it apart, those are, that's the DNA of Jesus. So if you, now, notice, if you take any chromosome out of the DNA of a person, it mutates them. So if you take out any healing verses, you have created a mutant Jesus. He is not the same Jesus. So healing is not a simple add-on. Well, we believe in healing. Well, we don't. Well, that's okay. No, it's not. If you don't believe in healing, you are denying Christ and his power. Do you get that? This is not an either or, right? This is all or nothing. And you will see that, that whenever he died for your sins, before he died for your sins on that cross, he first bore your sicknesses at that whipping post. You can't separate that. Now, you might want to rewrite history and forget that part. But if you do, when you take communion, don't eat the bread. Just drink the juice. Because the bread represents his body that was broken for you. And his body was not broken on the tree or on the, on the cross. His body was broken at the whipping post. His blood was shed for your salvation on the cross. So if you're not going to believe in healing, that's why for the first 400 years, there were no such things as healing meetings for Christians. The way all Christians got healed, there was two, way, two primary ways that Christians got healed uh, for the first 400 years. Number one, if there was any sick among them, brand new believers, they would call for the elders, and the elders would go and pray the prayer of faith and get them healed. The second way that most Christians got healed was through communion. And that was practiced every week. And so anybody that came in, they didn't even pray for them. They came in, they participated in communion, and as they ate the bread, they recognized, by his stripes I'm healed, and I received my healing. And they would eat the bread and be healed. We have done that all over the world when we have participated in communion services. And if they're sick there, there has never failed for someone to get healed during communion. Why? Because that was the way. Now, I will tell you, that is in 1 Corinthians, which was written to a carnal church. So that is the way for carnal Christians really to get healed. The way for spiritually minded Christians to get healed is Romans 8, 11, that if that same spirit that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he will quicken, make alive, heal your mortal bodies by that same spirit that dwells in you, not by that spirit that dwells in somebody else and you get hands laid on you. The spiritual Christian gets healed by the spirit of God that dwells in them. Now, that's great. That's what, God, that's what God intends at the same time. If you're hurting and you've applied your faith and you haven't seen changes, get help. God doesn't want you suffering. Don't be ashamed to get help or ask for help. Get help. Amen? That's why we have the body. That's why we have gifts in the body to help one another. We're here for each other because God is against especially unnecessary suffering. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's take a real quick break about 10 minutes, and we will come back right at 10 o'clock. Y'all get anything out of this so far? All right, well, we're going to run with this today. We're going to have a good time this week.